Hello, 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 and we are back again for another episode of The Dank Hour. I am London, your um, director of dialogue, you know, a conversational dude, and all-around guy that likes to talk about cannabis on Tuesday nights. Actually, I like to talk about cannabis every night of the week, um, and there's no real difference with today. We have some amazing guests with us, and we, as usual, we're joined with a little bit smaller of a party today. Um, but you know, it's getting to be that point in the year where everybody's starting to plant and, and really need to dig into what they're doing for their season and prepare for it all. I, you know, I did a, I did a fun post. All I did was tell me what's growing in your garden. And it's like the busiest post I've done for the last like two fucking years. So I've got like 50 comments in about 24 hours. Clearly everybody is ready to get growing in the garden and get a lot of stuff going on. Um, so I'm excited to hear about it. So make sure to hop in there and do that. But most of all, what I'm excited about is to be here with the panel of experts and to have our special guest, Curtis Lagsay, with us today. So why don't you introduce yourself, Curtis? I mean, I don't know if I'm saying your name right. Probably, maybe, you know, I think I'm pretty close, but uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, London. Uh, yeah, my name is Kurt Livesey. You were really close. And for the record, nobody ever gets it right. So I've heard live say, live say, uh, um, my in-laws still say Livesey. So like, it's it's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, let's see, where to start? Um, how, how far are we going to like go back to, you know, in the womb? Or are we going like cannabis experience or somewhere in between? Like, where do you want to go with this? Well, I don't know if we need to go all the way back to the seedling stage, you know, like we can keep it in like the vegetative, maybe what I would like to know is because you, you have a really interesting, and I was trying to bring up the email because it's actually um, your, 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 your degree, your PhD is in research and interpersonal communication, right? So why yes. don't we kind of start with that and then how that degree led you in this area of cannabis? Because those things, although they, they do sound like they, they, they go together very, very well in my world, um, a lot of people will look at that degree or that that, that connotation and go, what does that have to do with weed? Um, so yeah. I would love to know how that came about, maybe. That's that's fair. That's, that's actually an excellent question and a good place to start. So yes, I did, my background is actually all in the social sciences as far as my education background. Um, I did my undergraduate degree at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. It's a small uh, Christian liberal arts school. I did my master's, uh, a terminal master's program at Illinois State University, which is actually, I uh, reside with my family now, my wife and two kids, two dogs and a cat uh, in Bloomington, Illinois now. So we've circled back and come back here. And I did my PhD at the University of Iowa. Again, all of which was in interpersonal and or family communication research methods. <clears throat> so I had not the greatest experience in grad school had a little bit of a falling out with an advisor and uh switched advisors you know midway sort of midstream and when i got all done i was just like okay well i finished up my dissertation but i don't really think i would necessarily fit in the university setting very well at, at that point in time in my life and i'd grown up on a farm uh you know corn soybean cattle typical stereotypical you know uh iowa southern iowa small family farm and so um I kind of like went home to agriculture for lack of a better word and being or having a degree in interpersonal communication was handy. Cause like I had taught, you know, nonverbal communication. I had taught public speaking. I had taught research math. I, there's all kinds of stuff that I was, you know, well-equipped and trained to deal with people. And then going home to the farm, my dad was involved with um, an agricultural sales company. So it was just kind of a natural fit to like go into sales, right? Like some persuasive classes and all those things. So it did fairly well for myself. Um, we started a, a small ag sales company and then, God bless all those, you know, all y'all that are in sales. That's great. Uh, I just, I'm sorry, I have bunny trail sometimes. Fun fact, I got diagnosed with ADHD yesterday and just started meds today. So like when I say I have bunny trail, like it, it happens, right? Um, so little bunny trail here, but I, um, and then I sometimes forget where I'm going. So when that happens, just like, you know, type something in the chat or, or visually slap me back into line here. Cause I'm, I do struggle with that at times, but uh, I, I was, Sales are great. I just felt like given my training and my ability to read research, really for lack of a better better way of framing it, like I, I could take research and I could translate what was going on in the university setting and put it into like layman's terms for farmers. And so I could sort of like break that down and play translator in a way that most people weren't really equipped to, uh, at least not in terms of like commercial agriculture and agronomy. So we'd started this successful uh, ag sales company and I got bored with it. Like, that's the thing. I, I get bored pretty quick, ADHD. 
And I was like, I can bring more to the table. Like, so I kind of veered over into the consulting land, uh, still doing a little bit of ag sales for a few different companies, but our consulting thing really took off too then. And, you know, I was doing a lot of educational presentations uh, and this was all still big ag, right? This is corn, soybeans, wheat, alfalfa, the whole nine yards. Well, we did well enough that um, I caught the attention of a, of a, a medical marijuana group or a group that was wanting to get into medical marijuana in Washington state. So moved out to Washington state for five years, uh, worked on a project out there, super cool, super fun and interesting. Um, when that kind of all came to an end, I then kind of went back the independent route. And, uh, I actually, my company dynamite ag has the, the contract with, um, Washington state with the liquor and cannabis board. So I'm the scientific reviewer for the medical marijuana research license. So basically if somebody wants to come and get involved in this little micro climate or, or ecosystem they've developed for medical marijuana research, they submit an application and I basically go through and evaluate that, give them feedback on you know, what's valid, what needs to be worked on. Um, and I really try and make that an iterative process because I don't like the way that our predecessors have done it was just kind of like a pass fail and you didn't really know what you were sort of being graded on. Um, so I've tried to make that more iterative process and really help encourage the growth of that industry in the state. It's still going very slow for the record. Um, but anyway, um, so yeah, so during my time through um, sales and consulting and education and all that, I also kind of started off a, a, another company, another branch with what we do. So I have a, a specialty fertilizer manufacturing company where we manufacture a, a product called Pixie Dust, Pixie Dust Plus. And, you know, it, in case you hadn't noticed, in addition to being having a hard time focusing, I'm also a smart ass. Uh, can I say that? I don't know. We're live. I don't know if I can say that or not. So I'm a smart ass. And in you commercial, can say whatever the fuck you want here. It's totally <laughs> a safe fucking place. Better than being You're all good. Right? And, That's great. And so, I think half of us are ADD too. So it's, it's, it's yeah. you're in the right group of people. I'll, I'll fit right in. Um, so in commercial agriculture, basically if the local, you know, big sales conglomerate doesn't sell it, or if the local university hasn't been paid a just stupid amount of money to study it or research it, most farmers will write things off as snake oil or foo-foo juice or pixie dust. But again, being the smart ass, I was like, okay, hold my beer, watch this. I actually own the trademark on pixie dust. Like we, we spell it obviously P-I-K-S-I because I use a potassium silicate base in that product. And I just like, I became obsessed with silica. Um, and that really all started <clears throat> back like in 2013 or 14 even before anything I was doing in cannabis. And I just was looking at how do we mitigate stress? Like I'm sort of obsessed with, with like stress mitigation in plants, uh, whether that's, you know, corn, cotton, cannabis, whatever it may be. And so I just really fell in love with silica. No, nobody was paying attention to it at the time in commercial ag. And, and so I've got that offshoot. I'm starting a, a company with my brother-in-law we're working on right now. It's a, like a big data um, analytics deal we're working on for, like publicly available weather data and trying to utilize that for, to help farmers make better management decisions. So we're also in the process, my wife and I are, of, of starting a, a coffee stand, like a drive through coffee stand, because they're everywhere in the PNW uh, and they're nowhere in central Illinois. And so I have to have like 16 projects going at once um, or I can't function. So that's, there's the bunny trail version of where I was and where I am. I don't know if that answered the question or not. No, I think you. I think you nailed it. Pretty, pretty much on the on point. It's it's. I'm a, I'm allowed to say I gotta have 18 projects, otherwise I get really bored really really fast. Um, and it's the the segues are are definitely valuable here. So what take like what what I kind of wanted to get started and focus on is is and and something that we don't we 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 bring a lot of doctors on. We have a lot of great conversations and we dig in a lot of controversial subjects. But one thing that we don't really dig into as much as I'd like is. What do we do? Like, how do we properly conduct research and how do we properly do these things in, in the environment? It's a very simple part of what we do, um, but it's not something that we talk about. Right. You know, oftentimes when you look all over the place and in public, you know, whether it's social media posts, usually social media posts, 99 percent social media posts are going over to your buddy's house to see how, see how his plants are growing. And it's like, oh, I'm going to take two seeds and put them in two pots and one's fabric and one's plastic. And I'm going to fucking, the, the one in the plastic pot grows better. Well, like, it, I don't really think this is appropriate <laughs> methodology for research, especially with the stability of cannabis. So, um, like, what are kind of some of the basis to start off with that, that are high, that are important to touch on when we're looking at researching and studying what we're doing on a more, you know, um, home scientist level? 
Sure. So I have a, a little bit of a different take on this, I think, than most of, I don't know how many different PhDs you've had on here. And I'm not nearly smart for the record as Anna or Tess. I want to be like on the record as saying that because I follow them on social media. And the whole reason I'm even here was because I was like obsessed with Anna's research that I found like a few years ago. It was back in 2019, a piece she did. And it was brilliant. And it was, I was really kind of pissy about the whole Sativa Indica thing at the time. And it was just, she did a paper that was awesome. So, but where I sit um, being kind of in between like, the the ivory tower so called you know the of academia and the real world right like we have these two extremes that are that are problematic sorry i'm getting text messages on my stupid computer um and and i think that the two extremes neither of them really serve the the grower very well at the end of the day right and so the one extreme is you have this sort of like purist approach uh that's done in the universities where we have to have you know completely controlled randomized controlled trials uh, split block trials, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all well and good. Like the science behind it is sound. The problem is, and I can give you a very concrete example of this, is like sometimes we get so hung up on the damn science that we lose the real world applicability of that. And the, and the real world example there is, um, there was a researcher at University of Wisconsin here a few years ago that was looking at the application of sugar uh, in, in a corn crop. And in commercial ag, that's a pretty widely thing. Like widely used thing and some of the top end growers like the, the the corn grower contest winners and some of these guys will talk about hey we you know apply sugar feed the microbiology it stimulates stuff in the plants etc and so the researchers set out to study this well i found the paper uh and uh, what happened was they there was a nine bushel an acre increase okay nine bushels an acre and if you don't know anything about corn at that time it was probably like three dollars and fifty cents a bushel so we're talking north of 30 bucks an acre um, which is pretty significant for a farmer, considering you spent like $2 an acre on the sugar to get there. But it wasn't statistically significant. So the universities are notoriously bad about publishing a paper that's like, oh, sugar doesn't increase yield. Okay, but how in God's name this was ever published, I don't know, because they didn't publish the LSD, which is the least significant difference, which is just terribly bad. I, I can't believe that got through the review process to begin with. But I actually reached out to that uh, professor uh, publicly through social media and politely but firmly called him out and said, hey, why don't we discuss or debate this? And he wouldn't, he wouldn't talk about it. Um, yeah, and, and Anna's kind of messaging there saying statistical significance is, is annoying. And it, it's problematic in some ways, right? Because it's in some ways, it's a function of your sample size. You get a large enough sample size and anything can be statistically significantly different. And if it's too damn small, then you're not like, you have to have things that are worlds apart to be statistically significant. So that's the sort of purest approach that I find somewhat problematic. Then on the other end, and again, I mean, no offense to anyone here or, or listening, but you have the sort of like the, the sort of like magical thinking, right? Where it's like, oh, like I feel like, and for the record, guys, this is not unique to cannabis. Like it doesn't matter if it's corn, cotton, cannabis, cantaloupe. I've worked with every grower you can imagine. And honest to God, all farmers are the same. It doesn't matter what you grow. It's the, I tried four different things and I felt like it was this one thing. Okay, well now you've done nothing to isolate variables in any way, shape or form. So you can't, you can't draw any conclusions from that, right? So I sit in this sort of interesting space in the middle where I say, look, we need to try and do trials as best we can and control these trials. But I am absolutely not above reading published research and saying, OK, well, that wasn't statistically significant. But there's three different studies that all point in the sort of same direction, whether that's silica or uh, amino acids or whatever they may be. And none of them were statistically significant. But in every flipping case, you see some sort of a yield result or you see, you know, whether it's phytocannabinoids or yield in corn or, or whatever it may be, you get this bump. There's something to that. And we have to pay a little more attention to this kind of triangulation deal where we can say, OK, if we take the body of evidence, what does the body of evidence say? Um, yeah, like, like Anna says, you know, a trending towards significance. I like that. And my advisors would have had a heart attack, right? They always talk about like that. Either it's significant or it's not. Okay, well, bullshit. Um, look at the body. Like, what does the body of evidence say? But we also have to get away from this, like, you know, I felt like I thought that I saw that it was blah, blah, blah. No, you got to be disciplined enough to say, I tried this not on one plant in each, you know, in each scenario, but I did three or five or whatever. So that we can now start to account for some, you know, random variability. And if you can start to find this nice little niche in the middle, we can do good research without having to be this purest research that can tell us more than our gut says or our thoughts, or our feelings or whatever. So I get kind of wound up about this. I will jump in and say that um, we talk about this quite a bit, that especially in cannabis, since it is federally illegal in the United States and almost everywhere, that it's almost impossible to design robust enough studies to 
definitively say anything because people are either limited to just hemp or which is generally grown outdoors or if they're growing indoors they're limited to space and it's usually they're growing with a bunch of other people who are doing other research on let's say like tomatoes so they're in the corner of the greenhouse they're on whatever light schedule the tomatoes are on they don't have they don't have a lot of money to be funding this research um, and then, of course, in academia, you know, you're on a time frame as well. So you don't have all the time in the world. You don't have all the money in the world. Not like these big agricultural projects like corn and soy and um, uh, let's see, you know, I mean, you know, all, canola, all of the things. Um, and so, you know, I used to do a book club where we would read the cannabis papers and pick apart the science and discuss it. And every single one of them was like, well, how come their their sample size is only six or 12 or how come they did this you know light um cycle or you know I mean, and you lose you know if you if you're only growing two strains and one of the strains doesn't do well and they all die now you've only got one strain and six plants um so it's really difficult with cannabis and so almost every single paper where you're doing actual like uh agricultural or cultivation studies they all end with this is what we found um it's limited by this, that, and the other. More research needs to be done, right? I quite enjoy this because it is, it's, it's a funny world that we live in. So one thing that you mentioned that I think is, is kind of interesting is you mentioned there's a lot of often people, you know, whether it's outsiders looking in, or cannabis community themselves, you know, we, we, we often exclude ourselves separately from a lot of other industries and a lot of other spaces. We, we find ourselves being the weird outliers or the, or the weird guys talking about specifics about it. I'll let, I'll let, I'll let um, Tess in in a second, but what do you see, like, because I, I really like that, but it's, it's not exclusive to cannabis when we're talking about a lot of these subjects, like the, the, these actions and behaviors. What are some commonalities that you see um, you know, that you're, that you see in the cannabis space that you saw previously in, in the other industry, because you've, as you said, you've worked all over the place and worked with a whole bunch of different growers. What are, what is, what is a com consistent farmer challenge that, that creates other than this deviations in these plants or, 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 or moving their farm forward in a, in a more appropriate way? So I think, and I'm in no position to judge when I say this again, given the ADHD, but it's it's the competition of resources. And, and I think that our brain probably goes mostly to money when you hear that, but that's not what I'm talking about. It's the time and attention resource of, you know, if, if I've got a guy growing, you know, 3000 acres of corn and I want him to focus on, Hey, let's do a 10 acre plot or a couple of 10 acre plots. It would be even better. Right. And it's like, okay, well I got crap to do though. I got to go, you know, I got to go get all this stuff planted and I got to get everything sprayed and I got to get this, that, and the other done. And in the same way, you know, whether you're running a, you know, like a small greenhouse or a, a massive outdoor grow, like time allocation is, is massively huge. And I, again, this directly from the Bible, right? Like uh, among, chinner, uh, among centers of, of whom I am chief, I, especially given the ADHD thing, really suck at that. Like people here are agronomists and they're like, oh, like you can, you know, go look at plants and do whatever. Honestly, I'm not usually the guy in the field. I enjoy that, but like I I don't have the attention or the focus to be out there every single day like taking those measurements. Like thank God for like research assistance and, you know, uh, grad assistance or whatever. But then that takes money. Now where did the money think? Like you've got to have to the resources dedicated to doing that, whether that's you having eyes on everything and paying attention all the way along the way or right having the financial resources to have somebody else do that for you while you're managing the business and so the time i think is is the biggest issue because to do it and to do it well takes time that cannabis and corn farmers neither one really have so we're having a little side conversation right now about funding and uh what sources are there you know what if even if there's uh, hemp funding, you know, the the closest thing to cannabis. Uh, it's it's really a challenge uh, to be able to get that funding, number one, because there's really limited uh, grant dollars out there for this kind of research. 
Um, you know, it's not like the grant funding you get for studying cancer or studying um, other diseases like COVID, which, you know, had a boom in funding over the last few years and is now kind of going back down again. And the people who are doing the research are usually, you know, part of these bigger companies who have a little R&D team and they don't want their competition to know the the results of their research because it gives them a competitive edge. And so that's kind of the opposite of how academics fun function. You know, they have to publish their research. And so it kind of creates a lot of barriers for uh, real data and real movement. So I, I wonder what kind of like, you know, citizen science or community science that we could draw from that operates on really small budgets. Maybe there could be, I don't know if you know of any platforms or anything where like open source where you can share data and people can, you know, give input on it. Because I find that's one of the most frustrating things is like I I've seen this anecdotally. I may have a data set, but the people I work with don't want me to share that. So I can't really speak about it. So like I wonder if there is a better way to share data. I mean, I would say that unless, I mean, there are so few cannabis companies on that have scientists in any part of their staff. They don't have science advisors. They just are into making money, right? And um, they don't want to give up space. They don't want to give up revenue. And so I think until people start coming into the industry that are interested in getting answers to the questions that they have, because I just, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how we're going to do this. I think some answers can come from the hemp industry as there there's, you know, like I have, we, my company has a, a hemp plastics grant that we got, but the state is making us share the money with Stockton and Rutgers like Stockton is has done a lot of work uh with hemp plastics so no problem sharing there but now we have to share it with Rutgers because they're the land grant university in New Jersey and the state says you have to share the, the grant with them it's like but why <laughs> they're not doing anything um and I'm applying for another hemp grant this week actually um, which is a pretty intense, it's got like four different projects under it, but we probably won't get it because we're competing on a nationwide level with all of the land grant universities that want to do hemp research. And we're just a small company, you know, so we probably won't get it. But, you know, the process of writing this grant, there's other places to hopefully get grants. And so we'll have one already written. But, you know, competing with these universities Sure, they want to do the research. Do they have anybody who knows about cannabis at the university? Generally, no. The big agricultural land grant universities have done a lot of work on turf and corn and soy. And cannabis is not like those plants. And so they're really like jumping in two feet first and not really knowing anything about the plant. They're growing it. They're growing hot. So they can't even use any of the data that they generate uh, because they have to destroy it. And so it's like, a complete in my eyes it's a complete waste of money in a lot of cases to give money to <sighs> traditional research in institutions and 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 facilities and i probably am going to piss well actually probably the people who i piss off aren't watching this um podcast anyway so <laughs> so for all the people who are not in academia that's how it works and it's stupid and it sucks <laughs> what do you think about all the, the like third party testing labs that have a lot of data? They might not know what it all is because, you know, it was submitted. Um, but a lot of times third party testing labs will work with cannabis cultivators and help them design experiments. But again, that's that's all staying siloed and it's not being shared. I wonder if there could be some push. I mean, because because cultivators spend a lot of money on testing and that data just goes into a black hole. You know, they're just like, oh, here's a C of A. Did I pass or not? OK, that's it. But like if they're doing experiments to like pheno hunt or to look at, you know, different processes to improve microbial counts and stuff like that, 
that would be really beneficial if we could somehow push for the testing labs to anonymize that data so we don't know where it's coming from, but it could be used by other cultivators. Um, I would really love to see like um, a citizen science project kind of like, you know how, I don't know, it's, um, I don't know what it's called, but it's the Lilac Project and it's nationwide and you can download an app and what they really want to, what they're really tracking is like the phenology of lilac emergence. And they're trying to figure out, you know, things like, is it, are pollinators being affected? Is it, is climate change affecting the emergence, the budding of lilacs and blah, blah, blah. And anybody can go on this app and report data. Like, where are you? When did you see the first bud? When did you see the first flower open? When did you see pollinators? What did you see? All that kind of stuff. So I think it would be really cool to have citizen science projects in the form of apps where you could download data or insert your own data if you're like one farmer or one person who grows at home even your data could be part of a larger picture even if you're just one guy like what kind of fertilizer did you what are your lights set at like when did you see your pre-flower you know all that kind of stuff could be gathered and all of a sudden it wouldn't be an n of one or two or four it would be everybody's data collected in a central location and shared and of course you would have to have data analysts you know to do something with that data but as long as we had multiple people putting in the data and accurately reporting what they're seeing although when you're doing citizen science there is a measure of error just because not everybody's a scientist and they're going to make errors but when you're collecting a huge amount of data from a ton of people a lot of those errors will be smoothed away Right. So you'll have some outliers, but you're also going to have a lot of people who actually follow directions and do what they're supposed to do. So I think that would be super cool. I would love to see something like that come on board, but I don't have the capacity to develop anything like that. Um, maybe there's somebody out there who does. <laughs> and it sucks that Evian's not here to jump in because I know she's a big proponent of this kind of stuff, too. Can I rain all over your parade real quick, Anna? Yeah. So here's what happened in big ag with it. Well, there's, there's two major fundamental problems with that. Fundamentally, right? There's greed and you have what's happened like in corn and soybean world is you have these top end producers that have started these clubs where it's a data sharing club. You pay the head dog, you know, thousands of dollars a year to get in. And then it's this exclusive club where you get access. It's anonymized, but you get access to these, these other top end growers and what they're doing. And of course, it's, you know, it's almost like a pyramid scheme, like the dude who put the club together is making all the money. Um, mm -hmm. And how, you know, can you trust the veracity of the data? That's issue number one is, again, sort of corporate greed or individual greed. Issue number two, and I know you and I have talked about this in depth in the past, but the other thing there is at least in corn and soybeans and wheat or whatever, um, if I'm buying a, you know, a pioneer hybrid number, I know what that pioneer hybrid number is, whether I'm in South Carolina or Missouri or California or whatever it may be. Uh, and there's no guarantee that the two white widows on the shelf are, you know, from the same company are actually the same genetic. God forbid you compare something across states or whatever. Uh, and again, that was your paper that I drew on from the, the first time I kind of really brought that up. Um, and, and that is a problem, right? Because now all of a sudden, if we're, if we're putting in, you know, chemovar cultivar information, that literally is worthless info because mm -hmm. unless we have the genetic markers and the cannabinoid profiles to back that up, it's, I can call it whatever the hell I want. Um, and in fact, this, this should upset everybody. I did a FOIA request one time, a freedom of information act deal uh, for Washington state where I requested every instance where a grower had changed a cultivar name or a strain name. And they said, oh, we don't actually request, we don't actually require that input at all. So like you literally could go in and change Girl Scout cookies to White Widow to Agent Orange to I mean, whatever the hell you wanted to call it. So there is zero consistency potentially within a grow, much less across the country. And I think that that is a variable. The genetic portion of that is problematic. And if we could get but past that, could, we still have corporate group. But you could gather just general horticultural data, like light cannabinoid production, um, different nutrients, like, I don't know, how often does a light leak cause perms? <laughs> like you could gather, you know, just normal growing data, different, you know, regional 
data for people who grow outside. You don't necessarily need to same start with you know the same same cultivar. Um, for if you really wanted to get down to the nitty gritty about cultivars, yeah, you would have to make sure that like everybody's getting the same cut. Um, which you I mean with the great with, with the grow off that could be done. You know, you could start collecting data from the participants of the grow off and have it, you know, from year to year to year. But it, I think there's ways to do it. It couldn't be done completely on everything. And most people can't even afford, I mean, just I'm thinking of myself, like if I was growing, let's say six plants in Colorado, there's no way that I could take it in and get like a cannabinoid test uh, and pay for that. Like, for first of all, they won't let me because I'm a home grower. Second of all, um if i could it's expensive like 70 dollars a pop like i can't just do that <laughs> i spent a hundred dollars on two seeds full coa is more than 500 dollars. yeah know? right right exactly so, yeah i, I mean, think I, I think a lot of this stems from the fact that we are still stuck in prohibition right and that there's this artificial importance like your paper points out anna on THC potency and when you talk about statistical significance it's a nightmare if you think you could compare do pairwise comparison between testing labs you can't you can't because until you understand the magnitude of statistical error just on a single sample let alone hundreds of samples of edibles and flowers and concentrates you can't make pairwise comparisons between the labs because they're not using, there's no standardized methods. And because there's no standardized methods, the results are all just all over the place or a wreck. I want to go back and, and the, the subject about research, which is something that, you know, I've been trying to figure out myself is, you know, how do you fund research and how do you pitch it in a way that, you know, Anna, I think what you're saying is absolutely right on, which is that the, the, the small time grower is looking to get to profitability and and all of these things collecting data or you know participating in some data sharing pool or having your employees do anything that's off the critical path of bringing your business to profitability which again is we're all crippled by 280e and the confines of of prohibition and not being able to do state-to-state -state commerce it's difficult when you're trying to compare it to big agricultural production like soybeans and corn just because it's just a, it's not a fair playing field there's a whole regimen of crop protection chemicals that are designed for those crops and there's not one single product out there that's designed to be used with cannabis so it's just an unfair playing field but um, I want to ask our speaker a particular question because he's 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 from Iowa, and and thinking about soybeans and everything, you know, I think like a lot of people think like with the farm bill and everything that, yeah, you know, we can make hemp plastics and while it's true that hemp is a great source of cellulose, cellulose, you can't make plastics as we know them multiple plastics today cannot be made from cellulose that's just that's just not you, you can't do it there's there's great packaging applications for for hemp fiber and for hemp cellulose and all kinds of applications for cellulose making nanocellulose and other kinds of, of different types of engineered products but i want to get your opinion on this it's 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 my opinion that the real driver for hemp isn't going to be cellulose and fiber it's going to be protein per acre and so if you look at uh for soybeans for example soluble protein per acre is what like about uh, 356 pounds per acre or something like that with hemp seed they believe that the estimates are somewhere north of a thousand pounds per per acre so hands down you know protein per acre hemp beats soybean but now you're talking about going up against the likes of syngenta and dow and cargill and archers daniel midland big industrial ag and the soybean 
enterprise, which is basically, you know, we can grow protein on an acre of land and then use it in our food supply. So don't you think that the driver is actually going to be food and not fiber? But when all of that um, hemp acreage overtakes soybean and, and hemp protein per acre becomes the commodity of choice, now there'll be all of this fiber as a byproduct and kind of like the way that the sawmill and the uh, paper mill kind of coexist on lumbering trees couldn't you know there be new applications for all the the stalks and cellulose to make i don't know craft paper cellulose or cardboard or anything you can make with paper you can make from hemp so i mean it seems like there'd be all kinds of uh material available but the key driver should be feeding human beings and not powering cars to go down the road but i'd be interested in in what your opinion is of that yeah so what you essentially this this should just scare the hell out of everybody listening because you're I, I think you're not wrong but now all of a sudden rather than having to compete with the likes of you know the philip morris's of the world right because let's be honest it certainly feels like the biggest push for legalization of cannabis comes from both medical and recreational use and this the idea of protein or even fiber to be honest is is kind of started out as an afterthought and is now gaining ground because i think people are saying hey we can we can make inroads by not pushing the the sort of any psychoactive effect of this in any way shape or form but now all of a sudden you've entered into the conversation players like yeah the syngentas the bears the monsantos which monsanto is a subdivision of bear there's only like three ag companies in the world but you know cortevas um so you just opened up like pandora's box of the people who are are you know the, as far as like the big companies who are now wanting to come in and, and make a play in the space and honestly i have really super mixed emotions about that because i so strongly believe that we need the consistency uh from again point a to point b where whatever you know white widow versus white widow versus girl scout cookies versus girl scout cookies whatever if we're ever going to get to like true medical use that has to be consistent and in order for it to be consistent there has to be some sort of centralized or governing body that says hey this is what we say it is and this genetic is that genetic so that's the good part of it right the bad part of it is i think we all know what happens when you consolidate everything into three companies we end up with the world that we're in and i'm pretty sure that we could live in a much better world um with that said yeah protein i mean i i have hemp seed here i put on everything i think part of the the reason it hasn't taken off in the united states right now is because and i don't know if damon's still on with us or not but because of you darn canadians up there you're right, getting the corner on that market you were smart enough to to jump in there first and so like all of the hemp hearts right like kirkland hemp hearts that's like all from manitoba um and god bless you that's great but i i know so many farmers like commercial guys corn soybean wheat farmers who've like tried to get into the hemp game and there's no processing or there's no outlet for it or like everybody talks about it it's this it's the next thing that's coming and then nothing ever happens it's like it's a chicken and an egg problem you got to have the product to, to justify the processing plant but you can't grow the product if you don't have a plant to take it to and until somebody is willing to put big dollars on the line on a big gamble we're, we're it's it's kind of touch and go but w the person that's or the, the group that's going to be the ones willing to do that are going to be the big ag companies that's just my my two cents so but you you think like the 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 processors like the bungees and the the archers daniel midland like the people who actually have to put capital investment into processing infrastructure so like if there was a place that you that the hemp farmers could bring their seeds to get crushed and turned into oil and extracted and made protein so if that central facility exists do you think that that would i don't know spawn a bunch of farmers in that area that geographic area to bring crop to them 100 for, for for a very short time because then what's going to happen is this exactly like what we've seen uh you know in, in the states that are producing a lot of cannabis right now whether recreational or, me or medical um then it's a race to the bottom and now all of a sudden we have complete and total right. commoditization just like we have in soybeans here in right. central illinois right? right like you are going to be completely and totally um dependent upon uh what happens with the market so see that's yeah. where we're that's yeah. where the the, can the cannabis industry is in trouble today because because of the farm bill and for the following reasons it is cheaper 
to produce THC from chemical conversion of CBD than it is to grow, to get a license, grow, build a greenhouse, grow cannabis plants, extract the cannabis, make it into a THC distillate is more expensive than just chemically converting at shit ton scale CBD isolate, which has crashed now to $210 for a kilogram. Oh my God. Just like three years ago, that same kilogram was over $5,000. So $210 a kilogram isolate, and the number I heard was over 85% of all CBD being produced domestically is going into alternative cannabinoids, which is skirting around the regulated cannabis market. So our industry is really in trouble, and it's because of the, of the stupid hemp bill, which was ill-defined and really not well conceived by the intellectual furnaces that burn in Washington, D.C., I think this is like I never when I, when I started doing the show I never thought we'd have a conversation about protein per square acre, you know. Like uh, the, when it comes down, like I didn't think that that would be part of the conversation. You gotta but feed think, hog something, and we love spare ribs. So come on now. Fuck yeah, I, I love ribs. Well, that's the thing is is it's, it's that's part of what we're trying to do is have these conversations that 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 aren't really being had because we need to have them. The fact is, is that. If, if, if you have an entire system set up around traditional soybean production and, and, and doing that, you, you have to, all the harvesting, all the infrastructure, all the methodologies, all the, all the, if we're going to turn the, if we're going to turn the cellulose into, into paper and do the, the alternative stuff, it, it, it's a lot of infrastructure stuff that needs to be built. It's already built and very, very cheap in this other world. So without people talking about, and the thing is people are talking about medical cannabis and talking about the, the chemical constituents that get us high because you can't, can't seem to stop. But we're not talking about these other factors and these other, because these are other things that are going to slow down the entire industry as a whole because they're going to compete with it. Because, oh, okay, now we're now we're accepting medical cannabis everywhere. Now we, we got to make rules. Like in Canada, like it's just changed over the last little while. But you, you, you weren't allowed to use the stock or roots or do anything with it. You weren't even allowed to put it back in your soil. You had to dispose of it into a landfill, right? There's still not processes or permissions in Canada legally where you're able to do this, which makes no sense to me. We have these giant farms and all of this extra products going nowhere. It makes no sense. It's absolutely backwards. Um, it's, it's ass backwards is what it is. But it's, it's, it's that challenge of, of facing it in the space. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, because we're right at that point, we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to get into some of the stuff you've been checking out, Kurt, for the last little while. I want to talk to you a bit about pixie dust. I want to talk to you and get into silica. And, and, and I've had this itch in the back of my head about talking about some PGRs and kind of like what, what, what we see in that area and, and, and the challenges that we face and, and the, really the conversations that we're having with each other regarding these chemical constituents. So we're going to have a short break. So go get some, go get some ganja, um, roll it up because then you don't have to watch and listen, you know, do what you need to do. Not that you haven't been doing it the whole time. And uh, I guess Michael, we'll be back in about three minutes. We're going to have to do a little short commercial break and have some fun here.
Awesome. And we are back for another part of the episode. I mean, it's been an, an awesome one so far. And I mean, we've had some very passionate, enjoyable conversation. I mean, protein per square acre has been an interesting fact of, fact of discussion. But I, I think, Tess, there, there's actually, you, you have probably the most perfectly suited question for both our audience and ourselves and for everyone that's necessary. Um, so do you want to go ahead and, and, and jump in to ask that question for everybody? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, with research, one of the biggest reasons why you want to do it is because it, it knowledge is power and it can give you some answers. It can potentially point you in the right direction. And so, you know, when you're working with um, growers, cultivators, and there's like really common challenges that you're seeing a lot of people experience or that's really common in that particular plant or region. Um, you know, how do you inform them on like what R&D they can do so that they can overcome those challenges? Good question. So there's a, first of all, let me say, I think that the most common issues I see are not necessarily the things that are the things that are that should be studied in R&D. And I'll give, I got to remember what I can and can't say from a former employer, you know, what I was doing with the company out in Washington, but I'll, I'll try and be as specific as I can while also being somewhat intentionally vague. Um, so the two most common issues I see are probably pest problems. And I suppose that you can R&D on that, right? But like at some point it's, okay, am I willing to sacrifice, you know, half of my garden uh, to see like which of these two things works better on whatever this pest may be. And the reality is some pests, like there's nothing that's legal to spray for, like to get rid of these things. Like this just, it just sucks, right? Like it's just a damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of a deal. Um, and I'm specifically thinking of broad mites with that. I mean, they're just God awful. Um, I'm a big fan of, you know, using uh, predatory insects, like just sort of as a, as a, a base treatment uh, to keep things healthy. Cause I like that more, uh, sort of natural approach. You're not spraying stuff out there. Um, you're you're going the more biological route rather than the chemical route. I think that baseline, that's a good idea. At the end of the day, though, um, that's also, we, we have to be realistic about what is and isn't going to be effective um, and what kind of results we can expect to see with that. And so there are certain pests that you can deal with relatively easily with totally legal sprays and it's fine. And there are other things where, I mean, you're going to have a hard time getting rid of them no matter what you do. So with that said, what kind of R&D do we do on that? Um, you know, talk to somebody uh, like a licensed commercial pest consultant, which I was for five years uh, in Washington. Somebody knows what they're doing and then maybe run some trials. But that's that's almost like, um, you know, kind of a red alert scenario. The other one, I think, where we can start to maybe have a, a better answer to your question of like, what kind of research can we do is the, the newt lockout thing that we hear people talk about, which is. And, and again, I mean this with all due respect, but so often that's like a generic term for we don't know what the hell is going on. Uh, and generally, I think that's a result of over fertilization. And for the record, I see the same thing in big ag, right? Like farmers, corn farmers in the Midwest don't realize that most of the research that's been done was done on, you know, concentration based or like you know, using moles or millimoles or whatever. Uh, and they're all about pounds per acre, right? Like how many pounds of potash or phosphorus do I need to go, P205 do I need to go throw out there? I mean, hell, even like the glyphosate research or Roundup research, a lot of that early research was based on like concentration based. So what that means is if we're you know wanting to look at something in parts per million, there's no good direct way to translate that into this guy wants to go spray 10 gallons an acre, that guy wants to go spray 15 gallons an acre. Well, that needs to be adjusted, um, which will segue into pixie dust, by the way, here in, in a little bit. Um, but other than that, let me, let me tell you the, the sort of the, the good or not good. What's what I'm looking for? Um, the easy research that we can do. Okay. So easy research that we can do is things like plant density. And somebody made the comment earlier, right? Plant or uh, cannabis is not soybeans. And that's true. But I will say this, I was decent with my role in the cannabis consulting deal because of my experience in commercial ag, because there are a hell of a lot of similarities between cannabis and soybeans. Number one among those similarities being plant density makes a huge difference. If you plant your, st your stuff really close together, it's going to get real tall and lanky and it's going to stretch out. You can look this up. This research is called the shade avoidance response. It was done uh, in, out of Canada, actually. A lot of good research out of Canada on the shade avoidance response. And, and that is a function. Yeah, go London. That is a function of the plant sensing right competition 
And so they're like, oh shit, I got to stretch out. So they stretch to try and get to the sun. When we spread those plants out and we give them more room to grow, we're going to get a thicker stock. We're going to get more branching on those plants. Um, and the guys in the soybean world always gripe and complain because it's like they're out there trying to cut down trees and it's hard on their equipment. Okay, well, that's true, but it actually is a good way of increasing yield. And in the cannabis world, it's a good way of decreasing labor, uh, particularly when you're dealing with, you know, fixed areas. Uh, if you're in tables, um, you may find that, you know, thinning out your population a little bit will increase airflow, therefore will decrease uh, disease pressure, uh, will decrease labor, will increase productivity and all these things because, you know, what we could do, we could take this table and do, you know, five or six plants. And we could take this table and do eight or 10 plants or 12 or 15 or whatever. And that's the kind of stuff that I think really will make a difference for a lot of growers um, is that's more simple kind of stuff, right? Like the new lockout deal fundamentally, we just need to back off, like stop throwing so much shit at these plants and like ease your way into it. Because the other problem I see is like you get into so many growers and they're like, okay, it's got to be two mils of this and five mils of that and six mils of this. And it's like, okay, guys, again, respectfully, if you read the labels, you are literally using the same thing in three different jugs. Cause like, I don't give two shits about what the analysis is. I want to know what are these derived from, right? Is this calcium chloride, calcium nitrate, potassium sulfate? Like what are the ingredients? Because I can always, I can reverse engineer that. That's like, you can get a, a chemist to do that. You can go hire somebody to do the reverse engineering part. Um, and I will say this too. We, some of the research we did was awesome. We were using um, XRF or X-ray fluorescence technology. And I was analyzing some of those stuff that was in those jugs. And guys, I got to tell you, some of the things that like the guaranteed analysis are like, this was calcium nitrate and magnesium nitrate. The hell it was. And I can prove it. It was magnesium nitrate and a shitload of calcium chloride. Uh, cause when you get into the right analytical tools, you can start to like deconstruct what's actually in there. Um, but when we use again, like the secret sauce recipes, they may or may not be making a difference. So let's, le let's ease into those things rather than like throwing the kitchen sink at it. I don't know. I just take it, talked a whole lot. And I don't even know if I answered your question. I bunny trailed. Sorry, Tess. No, I was actually just about to follow up with like, yeah, that's, that's something I've seen too. It's like, oh, we have a problem. Just throw everything at it. Ah! Like, <laughs> you know, like, and that's not very strategic. And then if it does work, then you're like, I don't know what actually worked. And if it doesn't, then you ha are back. You just wasted a bunch of resources, you know? So, um, so like kind of going back to testing some of these, uh, you know, different stuff you put in the field and, and finding out that it didn't actually have what it says it has in there. Maybe that's a good spot for uh, growers to really start understanding what it is that they're putting in their fields or in their gardens um, by just testing some, some of their raw materials that they're putting into the garden and starting to understand. Um, and that has a big ROI because there's a, there's a lot of, I mean, there's, there's some publications on this. Like I, there was a publication that came out a couple, I'm a microbiologist. So of course I always think about microbes and beneficials in that way. But there was a publication that came out not too long ago where it showed that uh, they went and tested a bunch of commercial beneficial microbes. And most of them didn't, uh, didn't have what was on the label. And, and a couple of them didn't even have the microorganism that they were like claiming is going to be amazing. And so if you can just do some quick checking to make sure that what you're putting out there is what you think it is. That's, I think, the first step to really understanding, again, that knowledge is power, that internal R&D, um, and really making sure that what you think you are doing is actually what you are doing. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. That's you trust, but verify, right? That was the old, the old famous saying. So um, and that honestly is not that expensive. Like you can send those analysis off for, uh, for, I don't remember what they are. Like, I think like a Midwest labs is one that I've used in the past. I think waters agricultural laboratory can do this too, where you, you, um, you just ask, like you treat it like a water sample almost and say, Hey, like, give me the guaranteed analysis of the NPK. Like I know when we send our products off for testing, it costs us like a couple hundred bucks to get a, a guaranteed analysis of here's what's in it. And for the record, um, I'll also point out, we do things a little differently. I never only send in one sample because there's always error, right? So like I never send in less than three samples because if the two of them are clustered and one's way off, then I can say that one was probably some sort of an outlier. But if you only have one and all you send in was the outlier and you didn't know it, that's a problem. So I always encourage people send in an odd number, right? So that you, they don't cluster, at least you get one that tips the scale one way or the other, but send in an odd number, usually three, 
um, whether that's a liquid or a dry or whatever it may be. Awesome. This might be the perfect segue to get into pixie dust and what exactly that is. And I also want to talk about, because you mentioned you went down the silica rabbit hole. And this is like, I think something that's commonly misunderstood or not used or, or you know, there's, it, you know, often I find it's, it's, it's at the bottle of, of, of something very effective when you mix it in with it when you get a bunch of bottled nutrients from different brands and they're like oh here's the silica things go go fucked up really quick um but so like i'd love to know like first tell us a little bit about what exactly pixie does is and then i'd love you to kind of give a summary of like silica's role and and, and kind of your rabbit hole and and how you went down that sure so i started developing pixie dust back in again like 2013 2014 um, I had a grower I was working with up in the Red River Valley in North Dakota, uh, Southeast North Dakota. And he was like, Kurt, I've got this salt stress, like visible, cool pictures, awful growing scenario where you can like visibly see the salt, uh, like crusted sort of across the ground because they have a crazy high water table. And so it can never, you know, salt wants to naturally leach through, but if your water table is so high, it can never really, you get, can't get rid of it. So as the water evaporates, the salt stays on top. Um, and they were having a lot of problems. So I started researching and I was like, oh man, there's, you know, silica can mitigate stress. So we started playing with it. And the, the, when I say you go down the rabbit hole, there's so many, so many things to like unpack with silica, right? So first of all, you got to understand counter ions and, or counter cations and counter anions, right? So positively, negatively charged um, nutrients for lack of a better word. Um, and like what pairs with what and what bonds with what. And so you've got things like calcium silicate, uh, potassium silicate, sodium silicate, and then you've got, you know, monosilicic acid, which is just silica or sil you know, silicic acid by itself. Um, and there's so many sales pitches and so much BS to sort through when you get through all this. And, and as I was testing, I looked at all these different, these different sources and I'm not a chemist for the record. I have not had chemistry since high school. Um, and so that's, it's funny because I can hire I'm people to do that. Same thing, Mark. No, I'm 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 a chemist. Oh, you're a chemist. Okay, so yeah. Feel in free case there's any chemistry questions, let me know. Okay, I was gonna say, feel free to correct any wrong thing that I say here, right? But <laughs> basically, what I figured so far, out was so good. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. Um, I'm gonna destroy my credibility in one podcast. Awesome. Um, so basically, you know, calcium and silica bind up together really, really well, and it's not soluble for crap. So like, there are some really great products on the market. I'm not gonna name names, but really great products out there that I've heard good things about that are efficacious, but they don't mix for shit. And everybody hates them because of that. Um, you know, in my world, I, I played with some sodium silicate stuff. Didn't really like sodium silicate because I've yet to find a farmer that needs more sodium anywhere, right? Like I just have not encountered that. Um, and so I went with potassium silicate as a sort of base for me to start playing with and start building from because it was uh, more soluble. It was relatively easy to mix with things. And for the guy who didn't know chemistry, I didn't want to blow anything up. And I didn't want to have a farmer have a major problem in his tank. You, you get into the monosilicic acid world, and this is where people start making sales pitches. And this this part is true, so you got to be careful with this. Um, you've got this idea that plant, the only form of silica that plants can take up is monosilicic or orthosilicic acid, and that is true. Okay, the problem is it is highly reactive. It wants to bind up because it's an anion with those cations. So if you take monosilicic acid and you put it in a hard water spray tank, you're going to have calcium silicate like that, and you're going to have it all settling out at the bottom of your tank. Um, so by putting it in, like starting with something like potassium silicate, which is what I, I start with as a base for our product formulation. Now, all of a sudden I wait for you, you, you get that into an aqueous solution and you start to break those bonds and then you get monosilicic acid before it re reforms with something else and you get like free potassium ions. So it's time delay is not really the right way to say this, but it's a, it's a sort of delayed or protected application. And then I started adding things in on top of that certain, you know, synergists or antagonists or whatever. Um, what amino acids, vitamins, different things that I had found through my research that were working. Oh, and by the way, I would I would recommend these too. So I'm a nerd. I have several thousand dollars worth of books um, because that's what I do for fun, right? So like Silicon and Agriculture, and these are like all academic books. So these are heavy, heavy reading. This is like, you you probably don't want to be stoned when you're getting into all these or it's going to put you to sleep, okay? Silicon and plant diseases, um, soil fertilizer and plant silicon research in Japan, silicon and agriculture. Like if, if there's a silica book that comes out, I pretty much buy it. And I will do these again on the PGRs, by the way, London, because I know you want to talk about that too. Um, but I just, just like read everything I could. And I started looking at when I said concentration based earlier, like my formulas are proprietary. I don't have them patented. 
but we have several different products. And if I'm ever like, if a judge puts me on the stand as like, you have to divulge your formula. What I feel very confident in is every raw material that I use, I can point to published research and say like, here are three studies that show this raw material on this crop at these different rates. And here's why I went with it. And every, every, every single raw material I have that for. And so we've had a great degree of success with our products, both in furrow, uh, foliar seed treatment, because it's all science-based corn farmers hate this because they're like, what in the hell do you, they're like, you have been in the weed world too long. What's grams per gallon? Like, what is this? And I'm like, well, this is scientifically defensible. That's what this is. This is me being able to tell you that I can show you based on published scientific peer reviewed data that there is a high degree of success and our shit flat works um, because of that. Like we have independent third party data. There's a big seed company here in the Midwest called Bex. And they do not care. Like if you if your stuff works or it doesn't, they don't care. You send it in, they will study it and they will publish the results. And there are big name companies who have spent billions, that's with a B, billions of dollars in advertising on products. They've sent it to Bex. Bex has published multiple years in a row. They're like, hey, this stuff doesn't work. Actually, it costs people money. Like they are completely shameless. They will publish it. Uh, if you have three years of success, like positive ROI with your product, they will say this is PFR proven, which means practical farm research. They test it on their farms. So we were uh, one of the, the youngest companies to ever get this accomplished to be PFR proven. We did it in three consecutive growing seasons. That means that we've been studying in over nine states in multiple locations, multiple site years, and had a positive ROI on average across all of these different things. So I'm very proud of that, but I'm also not surprised because when you use science to build the products, uh, as opposed to like, hey, I think there's a market for this, it, it, it takes on a sort of a different life of its own, but it's all because we do everything concentration based. And so, you know, we've got that all done for, you know, corn and soybeans. I am actually working on some cannabis stuff at the risk of sounding self-promoting. So um, it's not like released or available yet because I'm also a bit of a nerd and a rule follower and I make sure everything is labeled appropriately. And so before I would sell this anywhere, you know, give it out, I want to make sure that we're good in all the states and, and checking all the boxes. But we are um, very, very close to releasing some like a line uh, for cannabis using the same approach or the same sort of philosophy on that. Very cool. Did I do okay, Mark, or did I screw up the chemistry? No, no, your your chemistry was was right on, right down the middle. You got everything, everything right. I I think where my fa fascination uh, in in silicates or with layered silicates, you know, that there's this whole world of clays and zeolites and these layered structures, layered and pillared structures. So they're basically um endless layers of silicate and every once in a while there's divalent cations that kind of hold those layers together and so as it turns out there's a whole bunch of chemistry that goes on in clays clay is just so amazing of a organized self-assembled structure that exists in nature and uh, i've done a lot of clay chemistry <laughs> in my career so we use uh, uh, clay. So cl it's funny you, you mentioned silicic acid. Silicic acid is a pretty strong acid, and certainly it catalyzes certain chemical reactions. And so there are um, essentially uh, uh, designed catalysts that are layered silicates where the, the reactant can come in and, and orient itself in a particular way to give a regiochemical oxidation or something. I think that's how they do the regiochemical oxidation of terephthalic acid uh, from, from xylene. I think they do it in some shape selective zeolite catalyst that's designed to like hold one isomer and not the other. It's so cool. <laughs> Well, can we can we talk a little bit about labeling and then London, this will transition perfectly into your um, PGR question. Is that cool? Awesome. So labeling is is really interesting. And I look at it when I put on my like farmer consultant hat and it pisses me off because the growers, whether again, it's corn or cannabis or whatever, you know, you guys are stuck in this world of like, we want to know what's going on, what's in it, how does it work? And I respect that. And you are tired of the sales pitch and you want to know what's going on. Now I'm going to put on my manufacturing hat and I'm going to tell you that um, if I, you know, as I look through these books, right, like what, like silicon and plant diseases. Okay. Silica is a stress mitigator in plants. It does crazy cool stuff. Uh, silicon and agriculture, same thing. We can mitigate, uh, you know, heavy metal toxicity. We can head, you know, we can help with lodging resistance. When you start getting into the pest thing, 
Okay, so like what silica does when you get silica into a plant is it actually strengthens the cell walls. If you spray silica as a foliar, it creates like a lattice like structure over over the leaf when you spray it as a foliar. Um, and so, again, I'm not talking about my products. I want to make sure I'm clear on this in case the EPA decides to watch because I don't want to. This is the cover my ass portion of this. OK, um, so this is silica. This is not my stuff. This is what silica does. And, and so you see all these cool things that, that silica does. But I made that distinction right now that I just made because I can't make those claims of, hey, silica will or my product will most likely help, you know, mitigate plant or um, biotic stresses in any way, shape or form. Because the EPA comes in, and they say, OK, even though you're not claiming to kill anything, you've made a pesticide claim. See, there's, there's two ways you can get in trouble with the EPA. You can have substances in your products that are considered pesticides, which all PGRs are. And that was going to be the segue for you, London. All PGRs are pesticides, period, end of story. Um, and that gets you, you know, in trouble if you don't have that labeled correctly or if, you, if you're using substances that aren't approved. Or secondly, the claims that you make. So even if I'm using silica um, and I'm, I'm saying, hey, you know, we can help with nematode resistance or we can help with white mold or whatever. Now you've crossed that border again and you're back into PGR land. And PGRs are an entirely different ballgame. So what we've always done is we just say, hey, this is a fertilizer, right? And I emphasize the potassium is an essential element. So you're getting that benefit. Silica is not recognized as an essential element, but we're getting there. We're almost smart enough to figure out that it is. Um, and so we'll talk about, you know, how it helps with cellular structure and supports lodging or, or reduces lodging. I can talk about that. I can talk about how, uh, you know, we can get silica into the plant and help uh, increase water use efficiency or reducing water loss because we can close those stomata and keep the plant from transpiring when it doesn't want to transpire. So as long as you make fertilizer claims and you focus on the nutrients and what the nutrients do, you're fine. So everything we have is labeled as a fertilizer. The second that you use an ingredient that is not approved as a fertilizer, or you cross over into, hey, I can help you, you know, mitigate powdery mildew, whatever. Even though the research, this book will tell you silica will help with powdery mildew stress. I cannot and will not make that claim about my product, even though there is silica in there because of the EPA. So there's a disconnect or problem maybe aren't the right word, but there's something going on where the EPA and the real world need to figure out a better way of talking about this. Because if I ever want to release like a PGR, it's like hundreds, plural, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and it's just, it's a major pain in the ass, right? Now, the way that ties into the plant growth regulators thing for you, London, is I think a lot of people don't know this. Like when, when I was working in Washington state, um, working with growers, like if you are using Clonex, and I, I'm not knocking Clonex in any way, shape or form, you are using pesticides. You are not pesticide free if you're using Clonex because PGRs are considered pesticides, not in the same way that like, you know, uh, Forbid or, or Avid or whatever, like, but, but they're still pesticides. And so you had to keep a pesticide log in Washington state. And if a grower wanted to claim they were pesticide free, you can't even use uh, Clonex. So I think that there's a misconception or, or that most people don't realize that um you know like if you want to talk about like salicylic acid or aspirin or any of those things like those aren't even approved pesticides or like pgrs so we know there's tons of research on some different substances and the cool things they can do for plants like those aren't even registered approved pgrs and now you're in major trouble as far as like crossing the line and again i think most people don't understand that but pgrs are a whole world unto themselves and it can raise some issues it's like Every month I get a new, I see a new post that somebody's put up and it's like, oh, this picture, it's two pictures. It's the same picture and everybody's probably seen it. And it's two buds next to each other. It's the same fucking thing that's been going around for fucking ever. And it's like this and this and this and this. And it's just, it drives me absolutely insane. So like I, I, I for me, PGRs, plant growth regulators are like, there, there, there's there's tons, there's all the natural ones you need you need pgrs to have plants to regulate growth like you don't have pgrs you don't have plants like it's just it doesn't make sense right you need you need them to be around so i want yeah auxins there's, there's a whole bunch i won't see all the all the all the complicated words because there's a bunch of complicated ones with it so but my question you know like to, just to get this started off because we are on our last you know 19 minutes here so if if you if anybody has any questions make sure to ask them on the way up um, or get them in now. I, I've been saving them if, if there has been, but we've touched on a lot of them. So what are, when, when you, when someone says PGRs or you see that 
that type of image, what, what comes to your mind? What's the conversation point that you get started with, with, with these things? That was a great way to start off though, with the clone X and the pesticide thing though, because fucking, we're definitely not getting a sponsorship from clone X, um, <laughs> which is totally it. fine. I am <laughs> totally okay with that. I never really wanted their money to begin with. Uh, but my, my thing is like, what, what, what does this ring to you? Well, I, I should say, right, this is not a paid endorsement in here or anything, but like I, it works, right? Like that's the thing is, is like the judicious, the judicious use of PGRs and understanding when they work and why they work and how they work. Clonex does work. Like I have seen it firsthand, 100%, like it does work. So maybe they can still sponsor you. Just want to throw that out there. I just want to make sure, like I said, when people understand, you know, what they are, how to use them, that they do understand if it has a little EPA number across the bottom somewhere, EPA number means EPA registered means pesticide. So that's where that is. Um, there's a lot of different things. And, and for me, I guess I'm less concerned about the use of registered pesticides and doing it the way that it's because like Washington state, when we were out there, right, they had a whole list of approved pesticides and some of those were PGRs. Um, Godspeed, man, more power to you. If, if it's working for you and, and I don't really necessarily like doing this in like a reproductive growth mode, I think if you want to maybe keep that on the front end, a little closer, you know, a little, little farther away from when the flower's being produced, I think that's probably better. But like those ones that are approved are great. I am more concerned about the ones that people don't know that they're using, again, like the Clonexes or like the aspirins or some of these other things where, again, there's good scientific evidence that some of these things work. But like, like seriously, if, if you if you're using something that is that the EPA considers a pesticide and I'm just going to I'm just going to harp on salicylic acid for a second here. So the EPA considers that a pesticide. There is no approved use as of right now, unless this has changed in the last like three months. Um, for salicylic acid to be applied on any plants because there are no tolerances established because nobody, no big company has spent the money to prove this out yet. Um, I think you can use it as a seed treatment. If I remember right, that's the only approved use for salicylic acid. So, you know, you get into aspirin, you're like, well, it's not, it's acetyl salicylic acid, right? It's acetic acid plus salicylic acid. And you put that in water, it hydrolyzes and it becomes acetic acid. But guess what? The EPA still has an opinion and they still call that the same thing. And there's a whole bunch of stuff. I don't know, like, like to Anna's point earlier about the universities basically wasting our you know tax dollars. It's true. They're like, they got all this cool shit they're studying that like, it's not a registered pesticide. You can't go use it. So you want to use a PGR, make sure you're following the, the label and Godspeed but just be really careful with the stuff that you've heard down the grape or through the grapevine, like, oh, this really works. It probably does, and it's probably completely illegal. Is it known how they work? Is there a general accepted mechanism, or is there multiple mechanisms on, on how they exert their action in plants? Oh, yeah. there's You get into a study of pathways, and it's super interesting. Like, it, But the fun thing is, is you can look at, like, certain amino acids can trigger certain pathways um, and be like upstream from certain like PGRs. So you can get similar effects using nutrients basically um, that you could. And then now all of a sudden you're legal and above board. So the study of pathways in, in plants, I think is just a totally fascinating study. And I've spent a lot of so time it's on that. So it's an induced response at the genetic level. So the, the, ge the genetics are responding to this environmental insult in this way. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're literally upregulating. So like great, great study. Okay. So, and again, I'm not claiming to look as a PGR. I'm telling you the studies have come out recently. Um, and for the record, the EPA does not consider silica a PGR as long as you're making fertilizer claims only, but like there are studies on, I think it was soybeans because soybeans are dicots and are not silica accumulators where you can upregulate uh, certain genes like the silica transporter genes because they don't have the LS, I think it's the LSI2 they're lacking. So they have the LSI1, which will bring the silica into the root. They don't have the LSI2, which crosses the Casparian strip and brings it up into the plant, right? So, um, but you can upregulate the genes that they do have by giving it more silica. It's like increasing the abundance of the silica that's there will allow that plant to act, be better about actively taking it up. And there's all kinds of cool stuff like that that you can get into with, you know, up and down regulation of genes. Kurt, I just well, I wanted to ask you one question just because it was in the news recently out of Washington State, that big news about DDT and DDE contamination. What What is your take on what happened up there? I'll be honest, I completely missed that. I don't watch or read a lot of news, so you'll have to fill me in. Yeah, so what they found was, um, this was back in about uh, April 10th or 11th, uh, a little earlier this month, is that there was a large number of samples that were recalled uh, 
based on being contaminated with DDE, which is a breakdown, environmental breakdown product of DDT, which again was the widely used insecticide that was used all throughout the Columbia River Basin in their uh, agricultural production. So it's likely that DDT contamination has been uh, in cannabis grown in this area of Washington state for years. And just the fact that they're testing for it now, they find it, but it's very unusual because this is something that again, DDT is not allowed. So it's certainly not allowed to be used on cannabis. So the cannabis testing labs don't test for it, right? So it's just environmental contamination from years ago because this molecule is super persistent in the environment. I thought being from Washington, you maybe had some insight on that. Yeah, so what's interesting is people need to remember, right? There's a lot of studies out there about this nifty little term you should all Google, and I'm, I, you guys have all probably already done this, but for the listeners, called bioremediation. And bioremediation is when we use plants to suck nasty crap out of the environment. And you know what a really, really, really excellent bioremediating plant is? Cannabis. So, you know, cadmium, arsenic, chromium, lead, it'll suck that crap right out of the soil, which is Chlorinated great. pesticides. <laughs> yeah, the DDT, which is cool if you want to decontaminate the soil, less cool if you want to consume it. So it doesn't surprise me. Well, the, the truth of the matter is that that cannabis probably won't be destroyed. It'll be remediated and turned into Delta-8 distillate showing up at a gas station near you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so like back to the PGRs a little bit because like we, we what about we, you talked a lot about chemical constituents that you can buy over the counter now people are you know using like making their own willow tea now they're using um you know they're making their own stuff from from uh not algae what is it but on the water, it grows. It's a plant in the water. It's a sea plant. I don't know why this is making me think of kelp, it. Kelp, um, kelp. You know, <laughs> thank kelp. you. Thank you. My, this, I don't know how this worked, but thank you. Um, so what are what are some things that we should maybe perhaps be avoiding in that area as additives or extra things that we're putting on our plants? Because, you know, like you can make some of this stuff pretty powerfully at home. People don't under, understand that sometimes. You know, not that we want to give anybody fear or anything like that, but are there things that, that we should be, you know, maybe a little bit more careful that you're seeing as practices or, you know, or is it pretty good to just play around with some of this stuff? I mean, here's, here's the reality, right? So it's kind of the same. It's like the same meta issue we have with cannabis where, I believe in the entourage effect. I believe in that sort of, you know, shotgun approach that there's something to be said for like whole plant as opposed to you know, like even roots and stuff rather than, you know, just um, specific cannabinoids. Um, but the downside of that is, and Daddy Mary's done amazing work on this, where you can cause problems when we don't know which cannabinoids are doing what. And we start to like the, like the, the story he tells about autism uh, what, and what they were doing over in Israel. He, I heard him speak a couple years ago at the cannabis science conference in, in Portland. Um, and that's a heartbreaking story, right? Where like the, the guy substitutes one strain for another because the THC to CBD ratio was the same. But then like these kids in autism had, with autism had major issues because some third or fourth or fifth constituent in there was different. And so the entourage effect really sort of backfired in, in, a, in a negative way. So the downside of, you know, if we're doing compost teas or, or some of these extracts at home, right, you may not know what all's in there. The upside is you're getting natural stuff as opposed to the synthetic stuff. Like we talked about, you know, the synthetic THCs or the, the different ways that we're now manipulating, um, you know, CBD into God only knows what's coming next down the pipeline. But on the flip side, you know that that's the pure thing that you're getting. So there's trade-offs. And I, I don't know that I have an answer. I wish I did. Um, but I think the big thing is just to be aware and educated and, and understand that there it is not without risks to just homebrew. Um, and just because something says it's on a label doesn't mean that you're not getting something. I think tests or, or Anna said this earlier, right? Like maybe that's the place to start. Like test the stuff that, you, that you're getting and make sure that's actually what's in there. Test your home roots, like whatever you're coming up with, see if see if you're getting extra stuff in there that you don't necessarily want or need or don't know what it is. So I think um, judicious testing would be where I would start with all of that, both with your own stuff and with anything else. 
there was an there was actually an awesome comment that actually directed to a lab that that had very cheap testing that you can send stuff off to as well that was in there. I got to re rebring it up, but I think these are, are are important. So I got one last question, and then we got the big question that we always ask at the end of that, the episode. What are because I just said labs. What are some? I mean, someone that's worked all over the the U.S. and understands the space quite well. What are some labs that you would recommend for sending in your these type of products for testing, whether it be what, what you're making at home or or sending it off? And maybe you can say maybe you can say maybe you can't, but I, I'd love to hear your opinion. Sure. So for the sort of gold standard in, in commercial ag has been Midwest Labs over the years. Um, my only sort of beef with them is they, I feel like they have focused exclusively on like soil chemistry and plant chemistry and have not paid enough attention to the biological uh, f functioning of the soil. So I'm a huge fan of next level ag labs uh, in Alpena, South Dakota. I know the owner, he's actually a close personal friend of mine. Um, so if you're looking at, you know, uh, soil type stuff, uh, plant, and when I say plant, they are not, I should say this, I don't think they are licensed to deal with cannabis. So this is more like, do you want to analyze, you know, the, the growing media, the soil, et cetera. Um, I'm not going to weigh in on like the testing labs because it seems like, I swear to goodness, every other week, somebody's getting popped for inflating THC levels or for, you know, I'm staying completely out of the, of the, of the cannabinoid testing. Okay. Um, but I, I do like next level ag labs for soil. I'm very well calibrated on the Midwest labs test because that again is a, is a simpler version for lack of a better word. Next level is going to give you more of a, here's the biological impact on your soil as well. Um, recently for anything water related or for, um, oh, like when we do all of our guaranteed analysis on our products, we go through waters agricultural laboratory and they have Kentucky and Georgia. So they're kind of in the Southeast. But they're, I just like the way that they get us the, the results quickly um, and consistently. And so they've been great to work with. Um, if you're testing in the biological world, I don't know, Tess, if you're familiar with these guys or not, but there's a company called Biome Makers. Um, they've got a B crop certification. It's another more letters I have behind my name. But they'll actually test products for, like you said, the does this have the biology in it that it claims to have in it? And are they performing the functions like a, that they claim they're performing? So Biome Makers for anything biological. Um, product analysis, I would go to Waters Ag Lab. Soil, I would go to Next Level Ag Lab. And if you don't know what else to do, send it to Midwest. Do any of the panelists have a, a final question or final statement? Crickets. I got to get a cricket, magic cricket button. Like that makes a little cricket sound. How do we get more people like you from big ag into cannabis? <laughs> God, I don't know. I mean, you know, my my foray into cannabis, I honestly was a function of me getting bored. Like I'm at the risk of something like I'm tooting my own horn. Like I had worked with the top growers in corn and soybeans, and I'm just like, there's not a whole lot left to do here, right? So I wanted something new. And right now, uh, here's our next big project. As I told you, because I got bored, we're trying to do a coffee stand. So um, I have a, a real passion for, I love coffee. Like I just, I'm obsessed with coffee and I really, really want to get into not only the selling it side, but into the cultivation side. Um, so that's kind of where my attention is, is meandering right now. Um, I think you got to have more scientists with ADHD. I, I don't know. Uh, I think Anna said, you know, once it's federally legal, you'll have some interest at the end of the day. You just gotta have people who are passionate about what they do, which is the cool part about like this group that we're in here. When I got invited to this, I was like, Holy shit, I didn't realize all these people got together on a regular basis. But like Damon and I have known each other for a long time. And I mean, 80% of the reason I get on LinkedIn is to watch Tess light somebody up um, when they're making like stupid claims. <laughs> I really thoroughly enjoy that test. Um, or to see like, you know, what I has published recently because it's, just, it's, it's fun, right? But like, it's a group of really smart people who are really passionate about what they do. And we just have to have more of that. So, Kurt, do, do you know Scott Sebastian? Does I know that the name. name. Ring a bell? It rings a bell, yeah, but I don't a, think I've met him. He's a champ. He's a champion soybean breeder. You, you know, I was at Dupont for almost twenty years, and Dupont bought um, Pioneer Seed Company. And uh, Scott was a champion soybean breeder who, you know, was responsible for a lot of commercial soybean lines. But in a prior life, he was chief seven turtles on Overgrow. So if you know um, Sensimilia Tips, which was a underground cannabis magazine back in the day, Chief Seven Turtles was Scott Sebastian, who became a 
champion soybean grower, and now he's retired and is back doing cannabis again. So he's probably watching. So hi, Scott. <laughs> love it, love it. So the big final question, this is always the ringer, but how can the community find support and, and get in touch with you? And but I got to say that as well. If you all really want to watch something entertaining once in a while, go check out Tess's 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 uh, LinkedIn, LinkedIn profile and fuck, give that motherfucker a follow because she's calling out all the bullshit. I fucking love it. <laughs> fucking love yeah. it. I it's so fun. Like, I gotta go. I gotta go chew on some people putting salt on their field. Fuck. She's God. nice about it though. She's never like rude. No, but that's the best uh, part. Like, it's, she's so polite that like it makes them look even worse when she does it. It's awesome. <laughs> I always just come across as an asshole. So, <laughs> okay. So, to answer your question, London, um, I've got a couple different websites. So, my consulting company is Dynamite Ag, uh, and you can go to dynamiteag.com. If you are in Washington State and are interested in the medical marijuana research license, there's info up there on that. Um, if you're interested in the sort of consulting side, data analysis, whatever, there's links on that. Uh, if you are interested in the pixie dust stuff or what we're working on, hopefully getting out here before too long, you can go to pixiedust.com and that is P I K S I. Yes. I'm very proud of this logo we designed by the way, cause that just, uh, I don't, I don't know which way to go that way. There we go. The, the KSI. Right. Yeah. yeah. It tells you, like it tells it. you that we're, we're, we're using potassium silicate as a base. That's obviously not all that's in there when you read the analysis, but, um, so pixiedust.com, um, and you can sign up there, like I said, and, and that way we can let you know once we finally get that stuff released. But dynamiteag.com, pixiedust.com. Um, I used to be a little active on Twitter, far less so. Um, I post a few things on LinkedIn. I'm really not as active on social media anymore. I just, uh, I, honestly, I was coaching my son's baseball team tonight before we got here, so I'm like kind of all sweaty and gross. But I coached uh, baseball, basketball, uh, soccer and chess. So I'm, I'm busy chasing my kids most of the time right now. It's, it's a good place to be in life. Um, but other than that, I just, I read research, you know, for fun. So most of my stuff is at home, but if you want to reach me, you can, you can hit me on, on the, on the websites. That'd be the best way to get hold of me. Awesome. Well, thanks again for coming in. We hope to like, I definitely have you back sometime in the next season or even later on in the year. I, I had a lot of fun having you on the episode. We, we, I think we all did. So um, with that being said, thank you for coming and uh, we'll, we'll roll the credits. Ciao, everybody. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks. Thanks.